Good morning, everyone. Good to see you here. It is cold outside. Praise God for central heat and AC. It is really nice indoors, but uh, it is cold outside, and we welcome those who have chosen not to get out today and uh, are at home. Thank you for joining us as well, and we'll be in John chapter 11. Today will be our last sermon in John chapter 11, and then guess what chapter is next? Yes, that is right, chapter 12. Good job. All right, John chapter 11, just to kind of review, uh, it is a big chapter, a very long chapter, lots of words there. It is a narrative, basically of one long story. It's, not, it's really hard to divide. I've chosen to divide it up into three sermons. Some people choose two, some ch choose more, but it seems, seems to be that three we can uh, do pretty good with John chapter 11. Uh, but at the beginning of John chapter 11, we find that and Jesus is still uh, where he was at the end of John chapter 10, where the Jews are wanting to kill him, arrest him. He goes away. He's about three to four days away from the town that he's going to come back to, which is Bethany. Uh, we see key players like Mary and Martha and Lazarus, who are all siblings. Uh, Lazarus is on the verge of death. Uh, Martha and Mary send a messenger to get Jesus, to bring him back, to hopefully heal Lazarus. Uh, but before that can happen, or before he can come back, even before he starts the journey, he says that Lazarus has died. But it's not going to be a permanent death. So he comes all the way back. Uh, there Martha meets him, and and there we looked at last week this wonderful, beautiful confession of faith where she acknowledges that, that she does believe in him, that he is Lord, he is Christ, he is Savior, he is the one who has come into the world. She puts these four titles upon him, and then later talking to her sister, she even adds the fifth, which acknowledging him as teacher. And it was just a wonderful profession of faith, lots of meat in there, even she knew Jesus personally, she still chose to address him in that way. And we kind of looked at that even in discipleship, like how, how do you address Jesus speaking to others? How do you address Jesus in your own prayer life? And how all these are on the table and, and options that we can use. Uh, so Lazarus has died. Uh, Jesus says that he is the resurrection and the life, and he doesn't just say that he is. He says, I am. We spent a lot of time on that last week. That is the fifth I am statement of the book of John uh, that follows the I am with the predicate, like I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd, right? So this will be the fifth one of those. There are seven total with that formula involved. So he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And when when Jesus says such a thing, it is, it is absolute, it is exclusive, he is the ultimate of that. So usually it is a type and shadow of the Old Testament. Then he says, I am, and uses the name of God, I am, ego ime, there coming from Exodus 3, and then puts something there with it. And this is exclusively, ultimately connected to him. So he is God, and he is the one who can raise and give life. And not only does he say it, but then he also does it. So this is one of those times where the I am statement aligns with a very visual miracle that substantiates it. Like when he said, I am the bread of life. He did this right after he had fed 20,000 people, right? Uh, so it was a very visual I am statement followed by a miracle. Or I am the light of the world, and then he makes a man who's never seen light, eyes open, okay? So here I am the resurrection and the life, and today he is going to prove it by raising uh, Lazarus from the dead. So that's kind of got us up to par here. Let's start in verse 38. And again, quite a bit of scripture to read. Uh, lots of story here. And we're going to finish up John chapter 11. So we'll go through verse 57. So follow along there in your Bible, if you will. John chapter 11, beginning at verse 38. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor. For he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, 
Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand <clears throat> that it is better for you that one man should die for the whole people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this on his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also together into one of the, into one, the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim, and there he stayed with his disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think, that he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know, so that they might arrest him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to gather together, Lord, and even indeed we, we thank you for heaters on this cold day that we're able to gather comfortably here to focus on you and to sing praises to you, to worship together as the body of Christ, and to focus on your word and to focus on this great resurrection that happened and how we as believers can rest fully assured that we will rise as well because we have believed in the one who is the resurrection and the life. And even though we die, we still live. We have eternal life, and we can rest assured in that. And even as we see this miracle take place today, as we read John chapter 11, help us to, to, to see it, to, to understand it, and also take great comfort in this, knowing that the one in whom we believe in is the one who holds the keys to life, who the one is resurrection and the life, and that he is our salvation, that we have trusted in him. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you for that great trust we have. Amen. Well, let's uh, go back to up to verse 38. Uh, this will be the seventh miracle, kind of as we covered last week, of the book of John. John chooses seven miracles to, uh, to record for us, then he believes that is a sufficient amount. He could have done more. He says there's uh, so many could have been written that there's not enough books on earth, he says, to record everything that Jesus did. But he says, these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So he's chosen these. He feels that they're sufficient enough. And we covered them last week, and in your discipleship, you looked at them, and there are a wide variety of miracles, right, from turning water into wine, which took no time, no fermentation process. If grapes were not even involved, he simply did it. Uh, to blind eyes being opened, to feeding people, thousands of people multiplying, uh, to making a lame man walk, to here making a person rise from the dead who has been dead for four days. So it's a wide variety of miracles that John ju does choose to record. So it'll be the seventh miracle. And the next one, of course, uh, will not be upon someone else. It'll be himself rising from the dead. So it's not, kind of not included in the, the seven where he is doing this upon something else or upon someone else. All right. So if we go back to verse 38 and verse 39, let's begin to dive into this last miracle. John says, Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against him. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. 
And uh, from this passage, we can recognize the fact that Martha did not expect Jesus to raise him from the dead. Even earlier, when, uh, when Jesus was telling her, I am the resurrection and the life, she acknowledges, I know that, that Lazarus will rise again on the last day. And assuming that was what was going to happen. And even here we see that she, when he, she hears the command to move the stone away, they're all presently close to that stone and she encourages it not to happen it's not that she's vehemently telling jesus no but all she has to rely on is her natural ability to think and every other animal and human that dies after four days in that that environment stinketh and there is an odor right and so she is wide aware that all the jews all the family that is gathered there if they move that stone away they are going to smell the rot of their relative, and she doesn't want that. Uh, as we covered last week, the Jews did not embalm. Uh, they would use spices and wrap them around the body, almost as camouflage that would last for a couple of days to, to, to cover scent, etc. cetera. Uh, but and they would bury them on the same day. So all that had been done four days ago. Now it had been four days. There was no more camouflage. If they move the stone, the deterioration process has fully kicked in. All right. So she is making him aware as if Jesus needs to be made aware that after four days, bodies rot. OK, and they don't smell good. So she's made him aware of that. It's been four days. Um, verse 40. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Now, verse 40 here, it could be that Jesus told her this differently during their communication, and John doesn't record it. Most likely, though, it was from what Jesus said to the messenger. So if you go back and look at verse 4 of chapter 11, uh, as the messenger is there, he says, but when Jesus heard it about Lazarus being sick, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So most likely, even though we don't have this recorded as Jesus talking to Mary about seeing the glory of God, most likely the messenger took that message back. We know the messenger arrived before Jesus and the disciples did, delivered her that message. When the, she, the messenger arrives, Martha's like, what did he say, right? Is, is he coming? Is he going to heal him? And, and the messenger says, this is what he says. So messengers kind of take notes and and give the message. So uh, most likely this is what he is talking about. Did I not say that you were going to see the glory of God? And she's refer he's referring to the message that he sent back. Uh, now some have wrongly construed this miracle to hinge upon Martha's belief. If you look back at verse 40, uh, and this is where it can be misconstrued. And I'm just throwing this out there, but you might hear something like this every now and then. Uh, probably not from someone here at our church, but elsewhere. Uh, did I not tell you that if you believed, so if you believed, uh, you would see the glory of God. Many charismatics who attempt to attempt healings and the healings do not work draw from this the right to blame the person's lack of faith as the reason that the miraculous did not happen. All right, such doctrine is not being taught in this passage. This miracle is going to happen regardless of whether she believes or not. Jesus has already alluded to that earlier in chapter 11, that this is not going to lead to permanent death. He's already said that. He's already announced it. it, it nothing she believes or does not believe is going to change that after Jesus has already spoken that, right? Uh, however, there is an interesting point here. Only those who believe will view this miracle rightly and see the glory of God. As we'll see, others who do not believe see the same miracle that Martha sees, yet they do not give glory to God. Uh, they definitely do not give glory to the Son of God. So from this, only believers saw the glory of God in the miracles of Christ. Others came up with every other reason. We've looked in, as we've gone through John, right? The Pharisees would blame it even on Satan himself. Instead of seeing this as the glory of God and giving glory to God, they ascribed it to Satan. Uh, they hated giving glory to God through Jesus Christ. But so here, if you believe you would see the glory of God is not that miracle is not hinging on that, but believers see the miracles and they do see the glory of God in them. All right, look at verse 41. Let's continue on. So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, 
Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. So four points kind of here in this statement we're going to break down. Some of them are very basic, but it's, it's worth noting as well. Uh, several things interesting about this prayer of Jesus. Number one, he did not bow his heads and close his eyes. Is that legal? Yes, that is legal. All right. Uh, he did not bow his heads. He did, he did not close his eyes. We've covered this before, but it is interesting that uh, we don't have anything really in the Bible about this. Like now it is 100% customary. Uh, if, if I say, let us pray, y'all's reaction is going to be, <laughs> it's, just, it's involuntary now, right? It's the people bow their heads, they close their eyes when it's time to pray. Nothing wrong with that at all. So please feel free to continue to do that. But at the same time, it's also not mandatory. I remember when I was a kid growing up in church, and uh, I was a really young guy, but I remember literally... For some reason, every now and then, at the end of the service, the pastor would say, every head bowed, every eye closed. And I would, I would bow my head, but I couldn't close my eyes. I, would just, I was like, oh, no, it's an attack from Satan or something. I can't close my eyes. And I was like, oh, God, please help me to keep my eyes closed during this entire prayer. And I always had a tendency to open them, you know, and before the word amen. It would bother me as a young kid. And finally, last year, Jeff told me that's okay. I can open my eyes. <laughs> but uh, it, it was something that bothered me. It's like, it's like it feels so legalistic about every head bowed, every eye closed, that it almost felt like sin if I did not do such a thing. Uh, but that is not required. So if you are struggling as I was when a kid to uh, keep your eyes closed the entire prayer, you're still okay. All right. And if you pray with your one eye open, you're okay. And if you pray with both eyes open, you're still okay. And what we notice oftentimes in the New Testament, sometimes in the Old as well, but, but people pray in all kinds of postures, right? Uh, sometimes on the ground, sometimes kneeling, sometimes lying, sometimes standing. It was most common in the New Testament, we see people praying, looking up the opposite of the way we do it now. So in a moment, when I say, let's pray, some of you decide to look up, you're okay. <laughs> it might not be our cultural norm, but you could easily point to scripture and go, uh, they did it there. <laughs> and I'd be, oh, okay. So you have those options, all right? Uh, most likely, uh, we get the every head bowed, every eye closed. Most likely from a path. You can look these up with me if you'd like. Matthew 6, verse 5 through 6 is uh, when Jesus is just teaching, teaching the disciples how to pray. But it's not, it's not uh, again, it's not meant to be. It has to be this way. But this is, what he's, this is what he says compared to the hypocrites who are praying out loud, the Pharisees, and praying publicly, trying to get attention upon themselves. I'm just going to read verses 5 and 6 of that Matthew 6. Jesus said, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. It's a most likely... We theorize that the every head bowed and every eye closed kind of came from that, the privacy aspect of that. Like it, we can't all right now go off into a room, we only have a few rooms here, uh, to pray. It, so it's, it's more of a head bowed, eyes closed. Uh, there could be an issue, an issue of reverence there now with that, but also the privacy seeking, right? If your eyes are open, you're more likely to be distracted. So kind of that, that most likely is kind of what happened here that we kind of got that theory from every head bowed, every eye closed. Um, so does this mean that Jesus broke his own command when he prayed out loud because he's teaching them to go into the closet and pray in private and pray in secret? Obviously not. Uh, the main issue there he's having with the Pharisees is they do everything for show. All of their acts of righteousness were before man and for the praise of man. So even their prayer life was out trying to gain glory for themselves, trying to get honor for themselves and not talking to God where Jesus says, hey, you, your prayer, go into your closet, talk to God, pray to God uh, privately. You don't need the big show out here. Uh, and, and they're wanting to know how to pray. And the most obvious ways they have learned to pray are from the Pharisees who go out on the corners and go out in front of everyone and put on this big show of their prayers and their prayer life. And we see an example of that, Luke chapter 18. 
verses 9 through 14. Turn over there with me. We'll read a few of those passages. Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Here we have an example of one of those public prayers that Jesus was talking about, that they were wanting to be seen by others. Luke 18, starting at verse 9. He, Jesus, also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. That's hypocritical, right? Uh, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, undul adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So this is a clear example of what Jesus was referring to back in Matthew chapter 6. Don't be like the hypocrites who pray that they may be seen by others and they exalt their own righteousness and then so also condemn others. You have the rich man or the Pharisee praying, thank you, God, that I'm not like, and he lists off all the sinners, and even points to the tax collector over there, thank you, God, that I'm not like him, and not even saying it privately, but publicly talking to God in this way. And then you have the tax collector. Nothing's necessarily wrong with collecting taxes in and of itself in that day, but they were known for doing it in a crooked, in a, in a way that was extortion almost, in an in a evil way, and it was a sinful way. So like Matthew, the tax collector, uh, uh, we, we see that, that within his story as well. So here you have this man who is acknowledging now that he is a sinner before God. And what does he say? He doesn't pray like the Pharisee did with his eyes lifted up in a strong position. But look at his position. Verse 13, standing far off, he would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, which means lifting up your eyes to heaven was the norm actually back then, but he wouldn't even do it. He felt such a pressure, such, such, such remorse, and was repenting for his sin that he couldn't even look up to heaven but beat his chest. So here you have a man beating his chest as he's praying. Is beating your chest while you pray the norm? Probably not, right? <laughs> but, it's not but it could be something that could be done. So you have many different expressions of prayer in the Bible is what I'm saying. Uh, so Jesus is not saying you have to pray exactly like this every single time. Uh, Jesus is praying publicly. He's not breaking his own rules. He's not praying hypocritically. And he is praying to get attention. He is praying to get glory. But is that okay? Yes, because that's where glory goes, <laughs> to God, right? Uh, all glory goes to God, and He is God. And so He is praying openly, out loud, to gather their attention and to, to receive glory. Uh, number two, Jesus prays aloud so that people will believe that the Father has sent Him. And this is key to why He is praying out loud. He literally is praying so that they may, be may believe. If you look at that verse there back in John, it is so that they may, may believe that the Father has sent the Son. So he is praying out loud so they will understand. And as we've covered many times throughout the miracles here in John, miracles validate authenticate and substantiate that this is a messenger from God. So Moses would do these things. So people would see that, okay, obviously God is speaking through him. Elijah, Elisha, and you can go down, down the line and think of a couple of others there where God is like, you, all right, I'm validating, I'm authenticating, substantiating your message by backing you up with supernatural proof. And so Jesus prays out loud. So it's not for his own benefit, but for their benefit that they may see the connection, the father-son connection, that I'm not only saying these things, but it is you with me, and we are doing this. So I think it's over a dozen times in the book of John. I just picked a few here, add them on my screen, but you'll see how important this is to Jesus. Um, in John 5, 22, he says, Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. All right, very important. 
uh, Jesus, but you have to acknowledge that he is the son. And we'll find out as we get into John 14 as well. No one gets to the father except through the son. So people who say, well, I believe in my own God. I don't need Jesus. No, nope, you're going to help. All right, that, that's, that you can't get to the Father uh, without the Son. The Son is the one who pays the price. The Son is who mediates between the Father and humanity. We are His objects of wrath. How can that ever be fixed? You need the mediator. You need propitiation. You need atonement. You need justification. All this can only come from the Son. Without the Son, you don't get to the Father. You dishonor the Son, you dishonor the Father. You must see the connectivity here. All right, uh, John six twenty nine. And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Extremely important for this fact. Understand this. Uh, John 6, uh, 38 through 39. Look at this one. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. So over and over and over, you have Jesus saying that you must believe that I have been sent from the Father. The Father has sent the Son. So that is why he is praying out loud, so they may believe this, they may see the connection there clearly. Uh, number three, let's go over there. Uh, Jesus refers to God as Father during this prayer. Uh, it was unheard of. We have no, no record of anyone ever praying to God as Father until Jesus. And Jesus is uniquely God the Son and can pray to God as Father. He acknowledges God as Father many times in the Gospels, many times in the book of John. And the Pharisees see that connection and they hate it because they did not pray this way. No one prayed this way. Uh, John 5, 18, when we, uh, Jesus is saying, that he works for the same reason on the Sabbath that his father works uh, because he is God. And they hate that. Look what, look what they say. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Is that true? Yes, that is true. And that's why the Jews were hating him. Uh, so even though Jesus is uniquely... God the Son, uh, we can still uh, talk to God as Father. It is not because we are uniquely uh, sons as Jesus is, but we are adopted into the family of God. So we see that even now, we as Christians can pray to God as Father. Multiple examples, one of them is Romans eight fifteen through 16. Paul says, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself self bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So Jesus referring to God as Father, extremely unique. No one else was doing such a thing. But now he says that we can do the same. Uh, we can talk to God as Father. Even we have the Lord's Prayer that begins with our Father, right, who art in heaven. Uh, so we, he instructs that, and we know that we can do that, and that is the position that we have now. Not that we are God the Son as Jesus is God the Son, but we are adopted into that family, all right? Number four, as we look at this uh, prayer that Jesus says, he did not pray that Lazarus would rise from the dead at that time, which is pretty interesting. If you go back and look at that, uh, that passage in John, in verse 41 and 42, So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. So, Quite interesting, he does not pray, Father, please raise Lazarus from the dead right there, and then and there. That prayer had already happened at some point, and we don't know when that prayer happened, but he had already prayed that, perhaps, um, even when the messenger gave him that message, we don't know. But that prayer had already been prayed, he had already knew the answer, but he is like announcing the answer at that time to them. 
All right. So, and he's praying for them. He's, pr he's saying this so they will believe and understand that he's been sent from the Father. All right. Verse 43. Let's continue on. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And it appears that Jesus prayed aloud to the Father just microseconds earlier and then cried out with a loud voice. So the very ones who heard him talking to God the Father are also the very ones who heard him call Lazarus out from the dead. Uh, so they're seeing, they should be seeing a perfect union, perfect unity here. As in John chapter 5, God the Father works on the Sabbath, I work on the Sabbath. I am claiming equality with God. Yes, I am. Same similar thing is happening here as well. Uh, the resurrection of Lazarus is a preview of the coming great resurrection that Martha had mentioned would come on the last day. So Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And he used that I am, that, that God term there, the name of God. He is the only one who raises from the dead. And, and here we see a preview of that. He says it, and then he does it. But there's also this last day resurrection that Martha spoke of that is going to come. And it's going to come for all believers. Uh, John 5, 28 through 29. Feel free to look these up with me. There's several here if you're wanting to make notes or follow along. But we see the Bible references... This last day resurrection multiple times. Uh, we do not find multiple resurrections, two big resurrections in the Bible, as, as some, some more of a dispensational, premillennial leaning try to find. But there's this one last day that is emphasized, one great last day, a resurrection, and then the judgment. Uh, look at John 5, 28 through 29. Jesus says, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So fascinating here. Uh, all are going to hear his voice. Lazarus is absolutely dead. He's so dead he stinks, all right? But yet he is going to hear the voice of Jesus and he is going to obey. He is going to come forth. And we find here, Jesus says, an hour is coming. This is that day where Martha is speaking of on the last day when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. How this exactly happens, I do not know. But we understand that all who are in the tombs are going to hear. How did Lazarus, a dead man, hear the voice of Christ saying, Lazarus, come forth? His ear canals were already dehydrated and, and gone, all right? But yet he was able to hear. Somehow the soul hears and the, the body is united. And it's amazing what happens as Lazarus comes forth. And there is no scientific explanation to this. This is supernatural. But not only does that happen to Lazarus, but Jesus says, Though do not marvel, do not be overly surprised here or shocked, but this day is coming for you as well. It's coming for me as well. When, it, when we will hear the voice of Christ and our souls will be reunited with our body and we will come forth. And it's interesting, as he says here in 5, not only for believers, but also non-believers. There is resurrection to life. But also in verse 29, he says, those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment, that their bodies, our bodies will be so created to glorify God in a way that we cannot even think or comprehend at this point. Uh, but we will be resurrected to glorify God and to receive blessing from God for all of eternity. But yet there is a resurrection also uh, for those who have done evil. And there's the resurrection of judgment. And they will be in judgment. They will be in eternity in hell and raised with bodies that, that facilitate that. All right? Move to another one real quick. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 52. You read much of this uh, last week in discipleship, so I'm just going to hit it kind of quickly here. But 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 52. <clears throat> Paul alludes to this great, this, the great mystery that is coming, this great day that is coming. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, 
But we shall be all changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. So Paul speaks of this coming day uh, that is going to come. There will be some who are still alive on that day. So he's saying we will not all sleep, but we will be changed. And in a moment, when this happens, you will be changed radically from being perishable like Lazarus was in the tomb he's already stinking right the odor was already there to imperishable the the inability to perish there is no decay there is no sickness there is no disease there is no illness there is no decay we will be raised like that one last one turn over there with me first Thessalonians 4 16 through 18 I love the way this one ends uh, verse 4 chapter 4 verse 16 through 18 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. For the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So here you just, again, we're focusing on Lazarus, but also focusing on the fact that this great or greater resurrection is coming for all of us, that we are going to hear the voice of Christ. We are going to hear this. Our souls are going to be reconnected to our body and it will be raised similar to, as 1 Corinthians 15 says, but different than and better than what we have now. And at the end of this, verse 18 of 1 Thessalonians 4, what does he say? Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Is it a good thing? Yes, it's a wonderful thing. And we're to encourage one another with this. If, if, if you don't know, your body is already deteriorating right now, right? You are, it's called the process of aging. Uh, where will you be 50 years from now, 100 years from now? You optimist 130 years from now, okay? Where are you going to be? It won't be here because you're in a body that is perishing. So what should we do? Think on the facts of and think of the practicality of your relationship with Christ. Encourage one another. Look. This life isn't everything. You're going to be in eternity, and you're going to have a new glorified body one day that has no sickness, no illness. You'll be raised from perishable to imperishable, and you and I are going to hear the voice of God, and our souls are going to be reunited with our body, and we will be with Him forever. That's encouraging. It's okay to speak of that. It's not that you love death. It's that you love life. All right? You're thinking in this direction. So he says encourage people in this way. So not only Lazarus, but all believers who die before Christ comes will hear the voice of Christ and rise from the dead. Um, as a side note, just regarding back to John 11, verse 43. It is interesting here that uh, there is no big theatrics, there is no big commotion or shenanigans when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Uh, you think of modern day quotation marks if you're just listening and you can't see this, uh, faith healers, right? Um, that that it's, it's a huge, big hoopla and, and all kinds of shenanigans and theatrics to do anything. Uh, you think of even, even the, the Bethel church that was trying to raise a girl from the dead forever, right? And it's this, it's this, and what does Jesus do? It is like, it is one of the shortest sentences in the entire Bible. Look what he says here. All he says is, Lazarus, come out. That's it. It's done. And here comes the dead man walking. All right. Life has come back into him and he is coming out. No theatrics are involved. No working up anything. And how much faith did Lazarus have to come forth? What did he do? He did nothing. God did it all. So here we have this, a great analogy of a visual aid, even of salvation. Lazarus is physically dead. We are spiritually dead. Who speaks life into us that we come to life spiritually or physically is Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection and the life. You are regenerated. You come alive spiritually because Jesus has brought you to life. Lazarus came alive. What did he do to a Jesus in coming to life. 
Nothing, right? He just stunk, and so did you, and God brought you to life spiritually. So lots of connectivity there, the physical aspect and the spiritual aspect, but yet they are the same. God is the one who is the resurrection of the physical body and the spiritual life as well. Um, go down, and this could be... This could rightly remind you of where he says, Lazarus, come forth, life enters in, he walks forward. It reminds me of two things. One of them is creation. Uh, where Jesus, where how, did, how did God create everything? He simply spoke, and it, and it was, and, and that's it. There, there's no great explanation uh, beyond that. And same with Lazarus rising from the dead. How does a person who's deteriorated, already stinking, uh, all of a sudden come to full life when God speaks? It's very similar to the creation. God takes things that are not alive and makes them alive. How? Because he is the resurrection and the life. He is the one who creates everything. And he's also the one who gives life. So uh, you could go to multiple verses. Just an example, though, Genesis 1, 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. Uh, how did God create these living creatures? He spoke, and, and the, it happened, right? And so very similarly to Lazarus here, when Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth, you have the same one who spoke these things into existence there at the creation. He spoke life. He created these animals. Uh, and then you have him here calling life back into Lazarus. He can do that because he is God. Another point uh, that reminds me of is, is, of course, regeneration, as we just looked at. But uh, turn with me over to Ephesians chapter 2. Hold your spot in John. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 6. And uh, just notice this example. Notice how this all ties in, kind of like we just explained, that Jesus is the resurrection and resurrection in the life of physical life and spiritual life as well. And they're so similar here. Ephesians 2, verse 4 through 6. Let's see who made you come alive spiritually. Did you do it yourself? Did Lazarus raise himself from the dead? Obviously, no. Uh, God did it. Uh, look at verse 4 through 6. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, notice the similarity there, made us alive with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So here Paul says, He's talking to believers now who have been saved, but he says they were all spiritually dead. And as we've covered many times, especially going through John chapter 6, uh, what can a dead man do to bring himself back to life? Nothing. All right. If you drive by a cemetery, you don't see any CPR going on because that person is deceased. Right. And they definitely can't self uh, incorporate the CPR. on the, There's nothing. We know this to be true, but also spiritually, uh, he says they were dead in their trespasses who made them alive. It's Jesus, God. He made them alive together with Christ. So the end of verse five. So is it by works or something we do to come back to life? No, he directly says the opposite. It is by grace that you have been saved. No worky, all right? Only grace. You deserve death. You deserve to stay dead. But God raised you back to life. So who gets the credit for that? Who gets the glory for that? Not us. We give it all to God. Sola de gloria. He brings us back to life. So the point of this is the beginning of your salvation is just as supernatural as Lazarus being raised from the dead. It is just as supernatural, you might say, if not more, than God speaking the creation into being. It is, it is supernatural in that you could not do this yourself. You're not a better choice maker. You're not a better decision maker than others. God brought you to life and raised you from the dead. So when we look at what he's done for Lazarus here, we're like, wow, a dead man walking that used to stink. Look in the mirror. That's you. All right. That has happened. God has brought you back to life. He's given you life when you were dead spiritually. Which one's the greater? 
uh, to be brought back to life spiritually or be brought back to life physically? Well, as we're going to find out, Lazarus is not still walking around right now, right? Uh, so it's more, much more valuable and enduring to be brought back to life spiritually. Uh, and uh, look at verse 44. Let's continue down. The man who had died <clears throat> came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. So in here, instead of having this uh, smell come forth out of the tomb, we have a man who comes out who is still bound in the linen cloths and most likely uh, the, their aromatic spices that would probably be underneath there, as we saw with Jesus. So he's coming out looking very much like a mummy, and uh, Jesus gives the directions to unbind him and let him go, which is which even this command is is really interesting because you have the Jews who did not want to be around a dead person because it was it was impure and they did not want to touch a dead body, and here he is commanding people to go touch him. And unbind it, uh, him. He is not dead. He is alive. So uh, fascinating here if you think about it, how does Lazarus' resurrection, how is it different from that of Jesus? Lazarus did rise from the dead. Jesus also rose from the dead. But yet there are differences that are there as well. Uh, Lazarus comes forward and he's still wrapped in all of his linens. Uh, did Jesus come forward wrapped in all of his linens? No, he didn't. They were, it was all nicely stacked up and piled up. and He was very organized, right? It was all right there on top of the tomb. But it was, uh, it was a, something, else, something else had happened there. It was different. Uh, we see that Jesus was able to appear and disappear. He was able to walk into a room that was locked. He was able to eat. He, they were able to touch him. He was able to sit with his disciples. He was able to make a fire for them to come after they had, uh, had, had been fishing that night. Uh, he was able to appear on the road with them and then disappear. And so we see that there's differences to that of Lazarus and that of Jesus. Lazarus, is, Lazarus was raised to life, but it was not a permanent life. Would he go on to die? Uh, yes, he would. Well, had he been raised imperishable? No, he was ra he was dead. He had perished, but he was given another perishable body still. So there is a difference that is here. Jesus has been raised imperishable. Jesus has taken his body and ascended into heaven and has that body with him so that we will be raised from the dead, but we're not going to be like Lazarus. We are going to be more like Jesus, right? So the body of Christ has been raised immortal, imperishable, and that is what we look forward to as well. So there is a, there is similarity, but there's also a difference here with the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection of Lazarus. Uh, verse 45, let's continue down. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. And as we've covered throughout the book of John, everywhere it says believe don't necessarily, does not necessarily mean that they believed salvifically in who Jesus Christ really was as Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, who's come into this world, right? Uh, like Martha's great profession of faith. So, so you have to read in context. And usually, uh, John will let us know, like he did in John 2 and John chapter 6 and John chapter 8. Uh, John chapter 8, the Pharisees supposedly believed. Then two verses or so later, they're trying to kill him. Probably not salvific belief, right? So you have to read in context there. So here John most likely is implying in verse 45 that they did, as Jesus had, had talked to the Father, I am doing this not for on my own accord, but for theirs, so they may believe that you sent me. And so most likely that in connection with this is showing that some truly did believe in who Jesus was. And we also see that not all did. Not all saw this for the glory of God because they did not believe. What did they do? They were tattletellers, as we would call them back in elementary school. Look at verse 46. Some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So Mary, Martha, Lazarus, 
Uh, apparently, lots of people knew them. Lots of the Jews come out. Bethany is only two miles from Jerusalem. Lots of the Jews come out. Some of the Jews see this and believe. I mean, this is this is radical. No, no one else has, has raised someone from the dead who's been dead for four days. This is this is unbelievable. This is God's authentication, validation, uh, verification. This is him. Yes, I have sent him. Some of the Jews go back. They tell the Pharisees about this, and they it is truly tattletailing. Hey, you guys know the one you've been looking for. He's just over here in Bethany, and look what he did. He went off and raised a person from the dead. And they're like, oh, we need to kill him for that, right? It's, it's bizarre, their, their, their depravity. Look at verse 40, uh, uh, 47. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. And, and this is fascinating. They, they, they come back and tell them exactly what happened. And, and the response is not, oh, wow, he raised someone from the dead. This is amazing. Uh, it's the opposite of that. He literally says, what are we to do, in verse 47, for this man performs many signs. In other words, what they've been trying is not working. They've tried to arrest him. They've tried to capture him. They've been wanting to kill him for some time. But whatever they're doing is not worked out so far. What are we to do? We've got to stop this because he performs many signs. So what are they going to do? Uh, they decide it's time to murder him. That is the solution. And what is what, what are they seeing as the problem if he continues to perform many signs? Many people will believe in him. That makes sense, right? And this is what they're supposed to do. That's why God gives supernatural signs to his messengers like Elijah, like Elisha, like Moses, and here like Jesus. It is to show we can't do these things. You can't go up to tombs where someone has been dead for four days and call, call them by their name and tell them to come forth. It just doesn't happen. So they should see this as a clear sign from God, but instead that we need to kill him and make these signs stop. And what's the other benefit or the, what they're worried about? They're worried about that Rome might come take away their position in this place. So Rome had allegated authority to them to some degree, as long as they abided by the Roman rules, that they could remain in their positions and they could have their temple, etc. But... Jesus was stirring things up in such a way that there would be political upheaval they were afraid of and afraid the Romans would come take away their temple and take away their nation. So what do they want? They're not giving up their position. Uh, and as we've seen, they're not on the side of God. Jesus calls them children of Satan. And here we see their heart all the way out, transparent. They want to kill him. Verse 49. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this on his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and for the na not only for the nation, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Uh, and this, again, just shows how far... The chief priest, the high priest, which is amazing. You think about this, the, the earthly high priest supposedly running the temple of God has just stood up and spoken. We need to kill Jesus, who is the ultimate high priest. And you see how far they are apart here. Uh, why? Uh, and it's interesting. You see this prophecy here also. That, uh, that, that there is this prophecy that goes forth that it would be better for him to die than for the nation, and they'll die for the nation. You see this substitutionary atonement uh, prophesied here. It's very similar to 1 John 2, 2. This one's on the screen. He, Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world, so that Jesus is not just the Savior and the Christ of the Israelites. But he is for those who are far off, for those anywhere in the world, Jews, Samaritans, and Gentiles. All right. So this prophecy goes forth, and it is definitely going to play out. From that day on, they try to put him to death. And, and you see, we, we could go into this further, but you even see this with the Samaritans when Jesus was there. 
talking to the woman at the well, and then she goes off into Samaria, tells everyone about Jesus, and then they actually believe in him as the Christ, the Son of God. And even though they're not Jewish, right? So it's, it, we don't need different saviors for each uh, ethnicity. We, there's only one savior for all. Uh, that's what Jesus is allude, or the prophecy here is alluding to. Uh, very quickly, let's finish up there in verse, verses 54 through 57. Uh, Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim, and there he stayed with the disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think, that he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let him know, let them know, so that they might even arrest him. And just to kind of summarize this last portion here, we see the Passover is coming. Uh, the Jews want to put Jesus to death. Jesus again eludes them, goes away, but he will come back into Jerusalem on his own terms. He will not sneak in, but he will come riding on a donkey this time. And as you remember, people will bring much attention to him, and he will be coming in uh, as the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world, as he will be laying his life down. Uh, in this passage, you, you, a couple of little things here. Verse 55, 56, they're wondering if Jesus is going to come to the feast at all. It was a mandatory feast, if you remember. From the Old Testament, every Jew of every household that is a male ha had to come back to this feast. So now they're like, is he going to come at all? And little do they realize he's not only coming, but he's, he's the star. <laughs> he is the Passover lamb. And all this is going to take place in conjunction with with the prescribed Old Testament feast. It's, it's, a, it's beautiful how God is going to play all of this out. Uh, long story short, Jesus said, I am the resurrection of the life. He said it and he proved it by raising Lazarus from the dead. We as well can rest and trust in that the one we have believed in, the resurrection and the life, we are going to hear that voice one day. Whether we're dead or still alive, at that day, that voice will come and uh, we will fully get to experience a glorified life with Christ and we are encouraged and we encourage each other with those words today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can rest fully assured that we have ultimate supreme salvation that goes far beyond this earthly life and that goes straight into eternity. Uh, to be absent from this body is to be present with Christ, Paul says, but also we know that even the body will be re reunited to the soul, and we thank you for that. We thank you that Jesus has given us such a clear example of just speaking and life re-entered into Lazarus. And also, God, we thank you for the comparison and the similarity that is there with us, even being here today, who trust in you and love you, that that love is there because you have made us alive. You have regenerated us. You have spoken into our soul, and we came alive. We were spiritually dead and stinking, and you brought us to life. We did nothing to get there on our own, as Lazarus did nothing to come forth that day. He came, as you called it. And we thank you, God, that you have called us and that we have come to you. You have made us alive. And we rest fully in that grace and in your power to not only bring us to life, but to keep us alive. That we have eternal life and that we will be with you forever. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.